right, hello everybody. Today, uh, I'm gonna do a short video um, starting a new series called Tech Tips Tuesday based upon something I've seen on the EEV blog. Uh, I'm trying to just increase the number of videos I get out in a week. I'll still only pretty much be doing a single video on the build processes that I'm doing because it's a lot of work. I put in you know, a lot of hours a week just building and then videoing it and then editing it and posting it. But I wanna try and get a little bit more content out. I'm gonna try and do more of the live streams as well. So I'm hoping the balance of at least those three, a live stream a week, a, a kind of a tech tips thing like this a week, and then a build series a week will hopefully keep enough content there to keep people interested. And uh, I do welcome comments and suggestions uh, for the channel as well. So please let me know what else you'd like. Um, also, um, I think that in a lot of ways, uh, I'm putting out here what I think I'd like to learn. And so some of this is me learning and I may make mistakes. So I also welcome uh, comments on the channel, people telling me what I probably should do differently or need to know better or whatnot. So I'm doing my best to try and help teach people, but I also want to learn in the process. So this week, we're going to look at the general idea of biasing a tube. We're going to look at the preamp stage primarily. Uh, this is uh, in most preamp stages they do cathode biasing. Um, and especially in the guitar tube amps I'm dealing with. So what I wanted to do is I've just got a, a, a nice visual representation of the plate characteristics for a typical 12AX7. I might've been the RC880 sheet, but I don't remember which one I grabbed it from. But they'll be pretty close to this in most cases. So the, the most important part I'm gonna show is um, explaining how all of this works and what I uh, expect to, uh, to explain is hopefully getting people an idea of what tweaking some of these parameters might do as well. So. Um, if this seems interesting, please hang in there and, and uh, follow along. So to start off, I got a lot of this information from reading a book uh, by a, a gentleman named Merlin Blenko, really bright guy. He's got a website called valvewizard.co.uk and he lets you have excerpts of the book and even a few chapters you can read them. I highly recommend buying the books because they will really, I think, help you understand a lot of this, in, in the, if, especially if you're the type of person that learns from reading. I kind of do it more visually myself. So reading it was hard. I've reread it several times. I get it, I think. And I'm hoping that that will make sense here visually for people that are visual learners. So we're going to go ahead and start diving in. So uh, I'll give you the reference to his website and I'll put that here uh, on the screen. But effectively, I would go there, check it out, read the book if you can, because it's also a great resource to understanding how this stuff works. So the general idea of what these sheets will do for you is allow you to see for a specific plate voltage that your amp might be operating in. And you, if you're designing one, you have to kind of guess what you think would be a good range but you can do these kinds of experiments to give yourself an idea of where, where you think it might work. One of the most common ones we often see is a 100K resistor with 1.5K cathode resistor in a preamp stage. So I have that, but I also have a couple variants as well. Um, but let's look at how you do the general math to do this. The first thing you do is you're gonna assume in most cases, these tubes will work in a fairly linear manner. Everywhere, as you can see, all of this is pretty linear, except in this bottom layer, the really low end, it kind of curves a bit funny. So you try and find, if you want to get consistent behavior out of your tube, you want it to be out of that range. The closer you are down to this bottom where it's starting to bend and curve, you'll get less consistent results. Uh, so that's one of the beginning considerations you want. The other one is you don't want to run it too high of a plate current because it, you know, it won't be great for the tube's life and longevity. So that's why you tend to bias more negatively because that reduces the current. And the other thing is, is you generally from understand never want to go above zero volts. And you also do not want to go above the operating range of the tube, which is generally towards the end of these lines. It will quite often actually draw on a tube chart what that is, but you generally want to keep left of a kind of an imaginary line to the top of where they've stopped the lines and you want to be below zero volts, so that leaves you this operating area. So, uh, and again, you also kind of want to stay above this part as well. So, you then choose a cathode resistor. You can look at the data sheets, they'll often suggest some, you can choose their suggestions, but you then do some basic math. You want to calculate two points for the line to give you a general idea of where the tube should operate. The first point is very easy. You choose the voltage range you're gonna be working in. In my example, I took it off of a, the, um, first stage off of the dumbbell that I'm looking at just to learn from it. But if I remember right, it was about 250. We'll see when I see this in a minute when I, and I do it because I did this prep earlier and I, I can't remember off the top of my head where that range was. But the way you calculate this is you calculate two points that are easy to figure out. One is assume the tube is literally getting no current through it whatsoever. That means the top of the tube is effective or the tube is at zero and then effectively the voltage at the top of the tube would be 250 volts and stays there if that was it. So your first zero point is right there. The second case, and, and, and that, should, that shouldn't really happen in most cases because you should be busy you know, pushing signal, but it could happen. On the other hand, the other use case is impossible, but it shows you the opposite end to create a line is, what if there was no current, hap or there was, sorry, what if the tube dropped every single bit of current through it, which is not gonna happen, but it could. 
what is that? So to calculate that one, um, you do Ohm's law and you calculate the um, voltage um, uh, at, um, or sorry, you, you calculate what saying the resistor itself, which in this case is 100K, is dropping all of that current or all of that voltage, which is 250 volts. So you calculate 250 divided by 100,000, right? Because it's 100K and you'll get a number and that will be the plate current that that would be the expected range in, in amps. But then to make it milliamps, you move that dot over a couple points. I've done the math ahead of time, so I don't have to look at it, but let's go ahead and pull that up by looking at it. So what that is, is literally at, uh, at oh, sorry, it was 200 volts. So at 200 volts, if the tube, if this preamp tube is dropping at 200 volts, then at two amps, it would be dropping all of it over the resistor itself and none of it into the tube. In reality, you end up lying somewhere here in the middle uh, and you're gonna be kind of balancing out. So then after you've kind of calculated that point, you, you're gonna try and decide what is the best bias point. Well, one of the ways to do that is to calculate then what cathode resistor you want to use. Uh, the data sheets will show you an example one, but you do this a little bit opposite. Instead, you start with a, an idea of two points on the line again, and this should operate mostly linearly except potentially down this area here. Um, you choose two points like 0.2 or 1.5 or 1.0, they're negative of course, the negative bias ratings, and calculate that drop across that resistor what the exact current rating would be there. Uh, so you know in the case of a 1.5k resistor, if we were to choose two volts, that's 1.33 milliamps. If it was 1.5, it's 1 milliamp, and if it's 1.0, it's 0.667 milliamps. So I'm going to go ahead and put that up here as well, and you'll see this then gives us roughly a good estimated bias point that hits kind of and crosses with this line and gives us a middle point between these areas uh, of, you know, just a little uh, higher than one, like maybe 1.2 volts. Um, so that is a first approximation of how you try and calculate what you want your bias point to be and how you would get that and what kind of values you use. Um, the what We're going to look at a couple other questions as well of what changes in that do. That's why I've got some of these values up here as well as different values. But I first want to show you what does the sine wave look like if we're looking at it. And I'll be manipulating this a little bit. But let's imagine this is the way the sine wave would be coming into your tube. Is it creates increases and decreases in the plate voltage of the tube. And at the same time, when it hits 200, it would be basically cut off and can't go past that point. And it can't go past the point where pretty much you hit this point here where the blue line hits that zero volts because we don't go beyond zero volts. So this isn't perfectly sized, but it shows you that, that is the operating range of the tube. Um, and it helps you see what size roughly, you know, voltage range or voltage sweep you'd have between 200 and about, you know, what is that? Maybe 80, 80, 80 volts. So you have a total of a, um, a hundred and, is that 120 volts range. Um, so that gives you a good uh, range of movement for the, that that, voltage swing can happen when it's doing its amplification. The next thing we could look at, let's turn off 1.5k and we're going to go to a higher one of 3k. And I've done the same math and you can do the same Ohm's law calculations yourself. But for 3k, look at how that comes across. Now, um, the line would in theory go all the way down to about here, but I just chose three points. But our bias point drops a lower to negative 1.5. Uh, and it also, if you look, it kind of makes it a bit smaller now to where we run out of um, you know operating range where we kind of line up with a zero. So if I was to turn that back on again, the sine wave, you can see it's kind of like, you know, it's a little bit it, roughly in the same range, but also it's compressed more on this right side than it was on the left side because this shifted to the right, which means the upswing would be a bit smaller. The similar thing, we turn off the sine wave if we adjust that and put in the, say, uh, let's do 820 ohm. It goes much higher. Oh, I didn't turn the 3K, but we can actually compare them visually. You'll see the top one is 820, 1.5, and 3K. So uh, that is to give you an idea of how that adjusts this range. When you move these up, we get uh, a different bias point for each one, slightly different voltages, but it also adjusts where that position sits. One of the other things um, that this adjusts is kind of how much harmonic distortion and, and uh, noise and amplification you get. The, um, the more amplification generally it increases the, the distortion, but it also increases the, um, I'm sorry, I said that kind of weird, but it increases the amplification, which is good, but it also adds distortion. So you kind of want to balance that. If you also look, if we go down to the 3K, let's turn those back off. 
uh, and just see 3k where's my 1.5k 3k sits down here at the bottom and as I said it's kind of compressed so it has the smallest amount so it's going to be the cleanest lowest amplification lowest distortion so that's why people use that quite often for a nice clean stage 1.5k is more common because it's more of a balanced fitting and then sometimes when people really want to drive a stage they'll go more towards a 820 to give it a little bit more of that push um, another sorry my dog Mallory is making some noises there another thing people will tweak sometimes is the actual anode resistor so instead of 100k let's look at a 200k now do you see how much lower that got look at the both of them together and you'll see it shifts it downward which will uh, give us more open room for more amplification more uh, mu if you will that gives you more output but also again same reason it increases a little bit of the distortion uh, and this Dumble actually quite often uses a 220K instead of a 200K, but it, it basically pushes the line down, gives you more range to be able to push that tube, so more, am more amplification, more drive, but you also add more noise and distortion. That's why he also would use things like local negative feedback to clean that back up again. On the amp I'll be building, it uses 100K, but you know that's the general concept here. So I hope those uh, concepts aren't too confusing. Uh, I definitely would like people to tell me what they think uh, maybe I'm missing here if I am, and also what I could explain better if there's some things about that that don't make sense. But please do give me some feedback, give me a thumbs up, like, uh, and please uh, let me know if there's more things that you'd like me to see coming out on the channel. Thanks, everybody. Have a great one.